goodness, I don't want to give licensure for people to just leave. Grayson, this is what I'll say you can do. Stay on for 10 more minutes. Work with us, kind of listen in. And at 9.20, I'll let you go. Okay, bud? So, yeah, no worries, bud. Um... We do we need to be recording for attendance? Yes, I just started doing that right now. Um, I think it doesn't start recording after this moment. I think it records after this, but just to be sure what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a screenshot of all of this, of everybody who's present so far. So that way I have it on hand. So if you guys are written present already, you're good to go, but you can write present again. So that's one, two, two presents for Jalen. So, awesome. There we go. Um, cool. So why don't we go ahead and I'll just open up today's homework. So this one's due today at 6 p.m. The uh, chapter five, part two is what we're working on today. So let me go ahead and open that up. Take a look at that. Or do you want to work on the chapter six, part one? What would you prefer? We want me to work on the chapter five, part two, or the six, chapter six, part one? You can go ahead and put that in the message box. I'll see it. Five, chapter five. You got it, Trent. Um. I will share my screen with you and we'll, we'll go from there. So taking a look at the first question here, if you can see my screen. Question one is asking, fill in the table, actually, before I continue, is there any specific questions that everybody has that anybody has that they'd like me to go over? Before I just start on question one. For all I know you guys all might be bored to tears because you already know how to do question one. Is everybody just cool with me starting with question one then, or do you want me? Okay, cool. I'll do that then. All righty, so question one. Fill in the table using this function rule. f of x is equal to the square root of x minus 4. Simplify your answers as much as possible. Click not a real answer if applicable. Well, this one's pretty straightforward. It's just saying for each values of x, it wants you to find what the value of f of x is. So when you plug in 0 for x, for instance, what you're going to come out with here is going to be, <coughs> excuse me, my voice crack, is going to be the square root of negative 4. Um, well, obviously, that just come up to be 4i, but we know that 4i is not a real number, so you can just go ahead and click not a real number, and you'll be A-OK. -okay. For the second part, you have a scenario where 4 is asked to be put in here. So if you put 4 into this equation of uh, the square root of x minus 4, or square rooted, you'll get that 4 minus 4 square root is going to be equal to the square root of 0, which is just 0. If we take 20 and put it into the x value right here, we can put, um, and put into the x value here. We'll have the square root of 20 minus 4, and then 20 minus 4, you know, is 16. And the square root of 16 
So most of you should know is just four. And then we have 68. If you put 68 here, 68 minus four is 64, and the square root of 64 is just eight. Go ahead and check your answers, and you'll see that's correct. Let's go ahead and try another. Fill in the table using this function. So this is a scenario. This is a scenario where you have a number outside of a square root here. So all you're doing is taking this number that is in the x value here, and you're going to square root it where it says x. So once again, we have negative 4, which is present in the square root, which we know is not a real number. You can go ahead and select that. And then for this area right here, we have the square root of 0 plus 3. We know the square root of 0 is just going to be 0, and then 0 plus 3 is going to be 3. Um, if we take 16 and put it in where x is right here, we'll get the square root of 16 plus 3. The square root of 16 you should know is 4, so what we have left is 4 plus 3, and 4 plus 3 is just 7. Now we have 81. The square root of 81 you know should be 9, and 9 plus 3 is going to be 12. Check your work, you see that's the correct answer. Alright. First question is pretty straightforward. Let's move on to the next question. Find the domain of the function u of x is equal to 3 plus x. Let's see, somebody didn't. That was just Sienna saying that she's present. Happy to have you aboard, Sienna. Um, so. How would you understand this to be, or well, how would you understand the domain of this function? Well, it's pretty simple. We have to fill in conditions where x, where this, where anything under the square root cannot be negative. So any number that exists that cannot be negative, well, sorry, that cannot, sorry. So any number that exists that makes this 3 plus x into a negative value will not be a part of the set, will not be a part of the domain. So, for instance, if we had x be negative 4, where we had 3 minus 4, you'd get negative 1, which we know is the lowest form of our, um, of our non, or our non-real solutions. So we know that, that x cannot be negative 4. Now, can x be negative 3? Well, we take 3 minus 3 and get 0. The square root of 0 is 0, so that's possible as well. Can x be 1? Square root of 4 is equal to 2. Yeah, that could work. Uh, well, it can be, yeah, so it could be literally any number in that case greater than or equal to, mind you, because it can include, because um, it can include negative 3 in that number. So uh, if it includes 0 and in any positive value that is under the square root here, then it can exist. If this value here is negative, it will not exist. And the only conditions that that is, it exists for is when x is greater than or equal to negative 3. And that's that's logically the best answer. If you want me to explain that to you again, I can happily do that. And the reason that is because when we're talking about domains of a function, we're talking about numbers that will exist on like maybe a plot or a graph. And they will not exist more like, well, they will not exist if the number right here is imaginary or not real. So we have to come, and the only time that those numbers are imaginary or not, or not real is when the number underneath the square root is negative. So let's go ahead and try another one. So for instance here, find the domain of the function. We have v of x is equal to the square root of x minus 2. So some values that might exist where x is less than um, is less than zero or this value right under here under the square root is going to be less than zero is for the values where x may be something less than two so for instance uh, if x was less than one is one you'd have one minus two which is this which is negative one you can't have the square root of negative one there so in this case x would just be uh, well x would have to be greater than or equal to two so that's your correct answer as well. Let's move forward. So now we're talking about a scenario where it's kind of backwards. Now we're trying to find a value of x that 
is now negative inside the square root. But once again, we can't have this be uh, a negative value. This has to be zero or greater. So to do that, we know that if we had x is equal to two, for instance, this would become negative two plus two, which is zero. But if we had x equal to three, then this would become negative one. So now if we increase the value of x, it doesn't exist. So we know that x has to be less than or equal to a certain value. Where if you put this down to negative one, this would only become uh, the square root of one, which is one. Or if we did, say for instance, if we did negative two, we'd have a negative negative two, which is a positive two, and then you have two plus two, which is four. So you'd see that this is actually going to be x is less than or equal to um, two. And that's the scenario, because if you put in a two right here, you get zero. Um, and you can automatically assume that every number less than this value is going to be um, part of the domain. Because if any number greater than that value, we know it's going to make this into a negative value. So let's go ahead and check that real quick. Let's see, that's the correct answer. It's good. If, you, if you'd like me to work on another one, I can. But that, that one seems pretty straightforward. You guys should know what I'm doing. Um, so now we're asked to graph this function. Plot four points of the function, the leftmost and three additional points. Then click on the graph a function button. So right now what we want to do, and I'm going to go ahead and I'll pull up my handy thing whiteboard for this one, is we want to find three points, or four points rather, on which the, uh, on which we can plot this function with. So obviously the leftmost point, just so you know, is going to be your zero point. So the point at which um, the value of f of x is going to equal to zero. Because once again, you cannot graph imaginary numbers unless you constitute that for your graph. But in this case, it's not. It, it, we just have a graph of just real numbers right now. So if we were taking a chart just like this, we had, f, we had x on one side and f of x on the other, just like that. We want to plot four points, so we know that f of x is equal to the square root of x minus 1, right? So what value of x would make f of x equal to 0? Well, that answer would be that x would have to be equal to 1, because then you'd have the square root of 1 minus 1, which would be equal to 0. And then you'd have... And then what you want to do is in order to find the next three points, the easiest way at least. I mean, you could do it any way you really want to if you can figure out what square roots of non-perfect squares are going to be. But the best way to plot this on your graph is, to going, is going to be finding x values and which make this value here, the value inside the square root, going to be equal to a perfect square. So perfect squares are 1, 4, 9, 16, 25, and so on and so forth. Um, so let's work down the line. So we already found one at zero. So let's find for the one at one, which is obviously going to be two. Because if we have the square root of two minus one, that is, those are not intelligible numbers. Two minus one, there we go. It's equal to the square root of one, which is just one. Um, if we had x is equal to five, we'd have the square root of five minus one, which is just the square root of four, which is two. And then our third point, um, well, we know that x has to be, well, that the square root inside is going to be our next value, our next perfect square, which is going to be th uh, 3 squared, which is 9. Um, so 1 more than 9 is going to be 10. So if we take the square root of 10 minus 1, we'll take it as the square root of 9, which is just 3. And so now we got our coordinates. We have our x coordinates over here. We have our f of x coordinates, which by now, you should realize that f of x is also the same thing as saying as y. And so now we're going to go ahead and plot these. Um, cool. We're going to go ahead and plot these. So we have. Connections. 
So we have one zero as our first point. somewhere so first point is that when x is equal to 1 y is equal to 0 so we go to x is 1 y is equal to 0 just like that plot a point maybe make this smaller so we can just take a look at it. or maybe I could just keep move it over to the side right here now it's still leaving there we go see how it looks just fine And then when x is equal to 2, y would be equal to 1. When, five is equal, when x is equal to 5, y would be equal to 2. And when x is equal to 10, y would be equal to 3. So now we have got our leftmost point, which is that when, x is equal, when y is equal to 0. And we plotted three points after it. Go ahead and head, click the graph function button, which is right here. Check your answer, and ta-da! Just like that. Um, so now that you know the general gist of what you're supposed to do, let's see if we can do one a little faster in the head. So it says to graph a function. Um, so plot four points in the graph of a function, the leftmost point and the three additional points. You guys know from there. So the leftmost point is where we the square root or the number inside the square root is going to be zero. And since it's just going to be x, we know that that number right off the bat is going to be zero. So, um, so when x is going to be zero, f of x is going to be the square root of 0 plus the whole value of 4. So the square root of 0 is obviously 0 plus 4. So when x is equal to 0, y is equal to 4. Just like that. So what's our next um, perfect square? Our next perfect square is 1. So we're going to have the square root of 1 plus 4. And the square root of 1 is 1. And then 1 plus 4 is going to be 5. So when x is equal to 1, y is going to be equal to 5. Just like that. So what's our next perfect square? After 1, it's going to be 4. So we know that the square root of 4, so when x is equal to 4, y is going to equal to the square root of 4 plus 4. And the square root of 4, you know, is just going to be 2. So 2 plus 4 is going to be 6. So when x is equal to 4, y is equal to 6. And then the one that it comes after that is going to be the next perfect square is going to be nine. Uh, so when x is equal to nine, y is going to be the square root of nine plus four. And you know that the square root of nine is just going to be three. So three plus four is going to equal to seven. And there's your graph. Go ahead and check your work there. And see that answer is correct. So there's a couple of ways you can go ahead and work it out and see it for yourself. Um, I'm hoping that helps. If if you guys want me to work that out in a graph, I can show you. I can show you how it works out in a graph. Okay, cool. I can put that on the chart right over here, just so you can see it firsthand. So we have our expression. Let me go ahead and just erase our previous work right here. So we said that our expression here is different now. Erase this. These contents in here. Can you do one more of those? Sure, of course. Yeah. So we have the function. So we don't know what our values of x's are going to be just yes. Let me go ahead and erase those as well. And fill in where I accidentally erased a little too much. Ooh, that's, just, that's just making things more chaotic. There we go. Perfect. There we go. Cool. Alrighty. Sorry, I get a little bit like Bob Ross when I'm trying to draw my graphs here. There you go. So let's take a look here. Now we have the function x plus f of x plus 3 here. So it's, oh my gosh, there it is, cool. We have the function f of x plus 3 here. So it's asking to plot four points in the function. So we want to find, so we know that our f of x, uh, our f of x is going to be x plus 3 here. And what we want to try and do is we want to try and find the value of x, which makes, it, makes this expression underneath the square root 0. 
that's going to be our leftmost expression right there. So this expression right here, we have to, we want to make this equal to zero. And to do that, well, we have to find out what is the direct opposite of positive three. And we know that the direct opposite of positive three is just going to be negative three. So we know that our leftmost point is going to be x is equal to negative three because if we take it and we plug in negative three for this expression right here, it's going to come out to be the square root positive three here, and we did negative three right here, you'll see that your answer is the square root of zero, which we know is just going to be zero. And so we know automatically right off the bat that when, negative, when x is negative three, that y is going to be zero. So let's go ahead and let's work our way upward. Now we're trying to find, um, the answer which makes this into the square root of one or makes the uh, value under the square root one. The reason we're doing that is because one is the next perfect square in the sequence. And mind you, like I was saying before, perfect squares are one, four, nine, 25, because those are, that's the square of one, that's the square of two, that's the square of three, that's the square of, and the square of four, and so on and so forth. So we want to find a number that makes this value here into the square root of one. And that number is going to be negative two. So we go ahead and write this out for you. We have the square root square root of positive three and then we have negative two plus three right here. That's just going to be the square root of one. Which makes our answer one right here. So we know that when x is equal to negative 2, y is going to be equal to our 1, which is right over here. So now what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a value which makes the square root, uh, makes this the square root of 4, because 4 is our next perfect square, which is uh, 2 times 2. So what value makes this into this x plus 3 into the square root of 4? Well, you'll see that 1, positive 1, will do that trick. And you'll see see if we put that into our square root right here that one plus three equals the square root of four which is just the same thing as saying two so we see that when x is equal to one y is going to be equal to two and lastly definitely not least we're trying to find for where this equal where the square root on the inside makes this equal to square root of nine um Obviously, you could pick other square root, uh, perfect squares if you'd like. You can try and find it for where the perfect square is 16, but you also want to keep the constraints of the graph, considering the graph that we have here isn't that big. So, the value that would make this square root here, or this square here, um, six, the square root of 16, well, uh, we have to find a number that is plus 3 to get 16. So that number is going to be 13, right? Oh no, now I'm thinking, now I'm thinking outside the box. Now I'm thinking of terms of square root of four. We're trying to find square root of nine here. Get myself confused there, get myself befuddled. So we're trying to find a number which makes this into the square root of nine, my apologies. So that number is there is gonna be x is equal to six, not, not 13, my apologies. So x is going to equal to six here. And what we're going to have left over is going to be what we said, the square root of some value of x plus 3. And we know that x value is going to be 6. And that 6 plus 3, there's good, plus three there is going to equal to 9. And the square root of 9 is just going to be equal to 3. So now we have our values. We have our coordinates. And now we're going to do is we're going to take these coordinates. And we see them as our x and y coordinates. So we have x and y right here. So we see that when x is equal to 3, negative 3, y is going to be equal to 0. We have our x coordinate here, and we have our y coordinate here. So when x is equal to negative 2, y is going to be equal to 1. And then when x is equal to 1, y is equal to 2. When x is equal to 6, y is equal to 3. And those are our four coordinates here. So this is going to be our leftmost coordinate here because when we're talking about 
exponentials, we can't have exponentials be in the um, have. Well, just remember that when we have exponentials, the value of the square root, you can't unless there's a number that unless the negative precedes the square root, you can't have a negative number inside the square root. So it's always going to stop at zero when y is equal to zero. So if we go ahead and plot those coordinates on our graph, so what we have here is we have negative three, zero, which is one, two, three, and zero. And I put it right there because that's the one. when y is equal to zero is just sitting on the x-axis there. Um, at negative two, y is going to equal to one. At positive one, y is equal to two. And at positive six, y is equal to three. And those are our three points. Go ahead and click that to graph it through. Um, if we go ahead and check our answer, let's see that the answer is correct. So hopefully that was able to kind of explain it a little better for you, Trinity. Um, and that's also on recording. So if you do forget how to do this, you can actually go back and take a look at it. I'll post this on Google Classroom after the session ends and you can uh, watch it back again. So it'll be, uh, it'll be categorized under material and you can just go ahead and you'll, the video will be right there. So cool. Uh, Brendan, do you have something? Oh, Brendan just joined. Welcome, Brendan. So we'll talk about we'll go talk about late to the party. So uh, I am the party. What are you talking about, dude? I am the party here. I am clearly the party here. If anything, y'all are early. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, welcome anyways, Brendan. Thank you. So let's move on to question five here. Oh, I just did all of these. Well, then you're good. We're just reviewing. Oh. So do I have to be here in the live? Um, you don't have any questions on this homework you're pretty confident about? Yeah, I'm confident about it. Um, why don't you hang out here for 10 more minutes? Why don't you hang out here until 945? And if you are confident there's nothing else that you need to review, then you're free to leave. Okay? Okay. Cool. So... Taking a look at this question number five right here, we have the we have gra it says to graph the function f of x is equal to negative two times the square root of x minus four. Plot four points in the graph and so on and so forth. So now we've got a situation where this square root of x is manipulated by a negative two, and it's being uh, transitioned by a negative four right here. And so this looks a little more funky to you. So I'll go ahead and I'll work this out for you guys again, just so you can see how it looks. Go ahead and erase these values in here. And we're doing the exact same thing as, a, as the first equation, except now, well, actually, what we're trying to achieve in this equation right here is going to literally be the exact same thing. Because right now we're trying to find values inside the square root, which qualify and allow for the square root to have those whole values again. And if you see right here, because, and this is actually going to be an easier way of manipulating it, because if you see, go ahead and I'll erase these values here too. If you see what we have here, the only value that's inside the square root is actually going to be x. So we just have to find some values of x, which make the square root, you know, perfect squares. And so because there's nothing else manipulating x inside the square root, we can go ahead and we can see those x values are going to be 0. 1, 4, and 9. And this, those are just going to be our perfect squares, just so you're wondering how we got those numbers. Because since we have an x here that's just the only thing that's inside the square root, those are the numbers we can automatically assume. But mind you, that's this, the, perfect, the answers to those perfect squares are not just going to be f of x, because we still have the equation here, uh, negative 2 times the square root of x minus 4. So if we were put in zero for this x value here, what we would get is we have negative two times the square root of zero minus four. And we know that the square root of zero is just going to be zero. Let me go ahead and I'll write that out for you just so you can see what we're doing here. So two times the square root of zero minus four. And we know that the square root of zero is just going to be zero, so we'd have left over 
negative 2 times 0 minus 4. And uh, negative 2 times 0, we just know that's just going to cancel out to 0. And what we have left over is this negative 4 here. So now we have y is equal to negative 4. So that's our first part of our answer. Well, what about when x is equal to 1? Let's take a look. So we have negative 2 times the square root of 1. And we want to work this out. So we know that the square root of 1 is just going to be 1. You know, the square root of 1 is just going to be 1. So we have 2 times 1 minus 4 now. And negative 2 times 1 is just going to be negative 2. And what we have left over is negative 2 minus 4. And negative 2 minus 4 is just going to be negative 6, just like that. And you actually see that we're actually heading downward in the y direction. And the reason that is is because we have this negative that's manipulating this square root here. And so that is perfectly acceptable. So let's go ahead and check out our next perfect square here. Uh, our next perfect square is going to be 4. So it's, we have negative 2 square root of 4 minus 4. And you can see that the square root of 4 is just going to be 2. So we'd have left over negative 2 times 2 minus 4, just like that. And so negative 2 times 2, we know, is just going to be negative 4. And negative 4 minus an additional 4, made more negative by 4, is going to be just negative 8, just like that. If it worked too fast for you, I can write that out for you. So negative 2 times 2 is going to be negative 4, and then negative 4 minus an additional 4 is going to be negative 8. And then we have this negative 2 here, and it's going to be now under the square root of 9, because 9 is our next perfect square in the sequence. So you know that to the square root of 9 is just going to be 3. The square root of 9 is just going to be 3, so it's going to be 2 times 3 minus 4. And that's going to be equal to, well, you know that negative 2 times 3 right here is just going to be equal to negative 6. And we have now negative 6 minus 4. And negative 6 made more negative by 4 is just going to come out to negative 10. So now we've got our four coordinates. We have our leftmost coordinate, where the square root, or the number under the square root is 0. And we have our rightmost coordinate, all the way leading to our currently rightmost coordinate, which is going to be the condition for where uh, the rightmost is the rightmost perfect square in the sequence. So go ahead and let's mark our numbers for our coordinates. So we know that when x is equal to 0, y is going to equal to negative 4. So our coordinate is going to be 0, negative 4. We know that when x is equal to 1, y is going to equal to negative 6. So our next coordinate is going to be 1, negative 6. When x is equal to 4, y is going to equal to negative 8. So our next coordinate is going to be 2, negative 8. And then when y, when x is equal to 9, y is equal to negative 10. Oh, sorry. This is supposed to be 4. When, y, when x is equal to 9, y is equal to negative 10. Just like that. So now we've got our four coordinates right here. We have 0, negative 4, 1, negative 6, 4, negative 8, 9, negative 10. Go ahead. Let's plot those points on our graph. So we have 0, negative 4. We have 1. Oh, sorry. Goodness. That is negative 4, 0. We have 0. When x is equal to 0, y is equal to negative 4. So 1, 2, 3, 4. Click. And then when, one, when x is equal to 1, we have y is equal to negative 6. So we have 1, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 now. When x is equal to 4, y is equal to negative 8. And when 
x is equal to 9, y is equal to negative 10. Just like that. Those are our four points. We go ahead and graph that, and you'll see that our graph kind of shoots that direction, which you'll see actually is the correct graph. So you can go ahead and check. You'll see that is definitely correct. So hopefully that explains to you there. Um, if you guys want me to do one more of those, I can. Otherwise, I can just move forward. What do you guys think? Pretty self-explanatory, or do you guys want me to try one more? You guys are pretty quiet, so I'm just going to go ahead and move forward. Presuming that you guys understand this. So, question six is asking Suppose that a wave forms in shallow water. The depth d of the water in feet and the velocity of the wave in feet per second are related by the equation of v equals the square root of 32d, where d is in feet. If a wave forms in water, at a depth with a depth of 6.8 feet, what is its velocity around to the nearest tenth? Well, you can use your calculator for this, and it's literally we're just putting in the depth in the square root, taking the square root to find the velocity, which is pretty straightforward. It's basic algebra. So what it's saying is that we know that v is equal to the square root of 32d. And we know that the depth right here is going to be this 6.8 feet right here. Let's go ahead and pull out our handy dandy calculator here. And literally, to find the velocity, we're going to be taking v is equal to the square root of 32 times our value of d, which we said was 6.8. Go ahead and hit that equal sign there, and we have this very long arbitrary number. And it wants us to round to the nearest tenth. So we have 14.75, but seven, but this five is in the hundredths. And because that five is greater than, well, it is five, we can go ahead and round this seven up here up to an eight. So your answer is that it's going to be traveling at 14.8 meters per second, or feet per second. But to think about that, it's very fast. That's nearly two of me for every one second. Um, let's go ahead and check our work. We'll see that's the correct answer. Uh, do you guys want me to try another one of that? That seemed pretty straightforward. You just literally take the number it says in the question and plug it into the equation. You guys are pretty quiet, so I'm going to go say, go ahead and say that's a yes. Move on, Mr. Driver. So I will gladly do so. Suppose that an object is dropped from a height of h meters and hits the ground with a velocity of v meters per second. Then, v is equal to the square root of 19.6 times the height. If an object hits the ground with a velocity of 29.3 meters per second, from what height was it dropped? Can you carry your intermediate computations to at least four decimal places and round your answer to the nearest tenth? So this is what it's saying, and I'll go ahead and I'll show this to you on your whiteboard. It's asking for you to solve for h. And to do that, we're going to simply substitute the value of v with what the question gives. So let's go ahead. Let me go ahead and erase the work from the previous problem. Just like that. There we go. And let's go ahead and work this out. So we have the equation right here that v is equal to the square root of 19.6 and then equal to some value of h here. Right, so in order to solve for v, we're gonna we know that v itself is going to be equal to what does it say? V is equal to 29.3 meters per second. 29.3 meters per second. And actually, this is kind of like basic physics. This is the introduction to some equations in physics, which you can see. Um, so with that said, we know that the square root of 19.6 times h is going to be equal 
to our velocity, which we said was going to be 29.3 right here, right? So now our main objective is to solve for uh, h. And we know that h and 19.6 are both going to be inside the square root. And to cancel the square root, uh, what you're going to do is you're going to square both sides. Because remember that if you square both sides, that's just going to go ahead and cancel the square root all together. And you're going to be left with the base, which is 19.6 times h. But now you've got 29.3 here, and we just squared that. So let's go ahead and take pull out our square calculator. Let's go ahead and square 29.3. And our answer is going to be 858.49, which is, um, which sounds correct. So it's going to be 858.49. And just so you're aware, I'm writing this on my whiteboard, which you don't see right now, but now you do. And so that 858.49 is going to be equal to 19.6 times h just like that. And now to solve for the to solve for h, we have um, this h right here multiplied by this 19.6. So to isolate h, we're just going to divide both sides by 19.6. And now we have our huge large number right here, and we're going to go ahead and divide that by that 19.6 right here. Oop. That was not what I intended. There we go. So 19.6. So let's go ahead and hit the enter button there. You see our answer is going to be 43.8. Um, it tells us to round our final answer, because this is going to be your final answer, because you see that's what that happened, because that's what h is going to equal to. Because if we write that down, that h is equal to 43.8005. This is saying that the height at which it was dropped is 43.8055 meters. So that's what we're looking for. That's our answer. And we want to round this to the nearest tenth. This five right here, this turns this into a one. That one turns this, keeps this into a zero. So there's not really much we're changing. Um, this is your tenth value right here. So you're going to have that to be your final answer. So your final answer is going to be h is equal to 43. So go ahead and check your work right here. You'll see that's the correct answer. Go ahead. Let me zoom out for you so you can take how what we did here in the video. Just like that. Um, I think I got time for one more. And then that's going to be as much as we can work on today. Is there a specific question anybody had? Or do you guys just want me to work on number, uh, number nine and number eight and call it a day? Number eight and call it a day. I hear Trinity. I see Trinity nodding her head there. Cool. I can. I can just do number eight. So let's go ahead and do number eight real quick. The function f is defined as follows: f of x is equal to the cube root of x plus two. Find this. Find f of negative twenty nine and f of sixty two. Okay. We could do that. So. This is where we really want to figure out or understand what our cube root values are. So let's go ahead and let me erase our previous work from our original. There we go. And our first function here, or our function that we have to begin with, is that f of x is equal to the cube root of x plus 2. And we want to find out what f of x is when we have x be going to be negative 29 and f of and when x is going to be 62. So well, let's just go ahead and take it some time to figure that out. So if we have that well, well what we're going to have here is we're going to have the cube root of x plus 2. And we know that x is going to be negative 29. So let's go ahead and work this out first. First, we want to find out what's inside the square root, or the cube root to begin with, which is going to be negative 29 made more positive by 2. I'm sorry, you can't see my whiteboard. There we go. 
we now we're going to find what's in the cube root first, which is going to be negative 29 made more positive by 2. And if you make that more positive by 2, you're going to see that's going to come out to be negative 27, the cube root of negative 27. Now, here's the tricky thing is that before, when we had negatives inside the square root, we'd come up with imaginary numbers. And I've taught you this before. But for now, if we have negatives inside of a cube root, it's going to come out to be this cube root, or it's going to come become, it, you, that is actually a possible scenario. You can actually come up with a negative. So you have to and tell me, if, and if you have a negative that's inside the cube root here, it's possible for your base number to be negative as well. So in this case, the cube root of 27, um, I can go ahead and tell you that the cube root of 27 is just going to be 3. Um, but because this is negative, we know that this negative here is going to make this into a negative 3. And that's the answer for your first one. And you're thinking, well, Mr. Driver, how do you know that? Well, if you have 3 times 3, 3 times 3 is going to be 9. And if you have an additional 3 that goes to that, 3 times 3 times 3, it's going to be 3 times 3, which is 9 times 3, which is going to be 27. So that's how I figured out the cube root there. Um, so now let's take a look at the second scenario, and we gotta work through it a little faster because I know we've already reached 56 here. You guys have other places to be, so we're gonna do the cube root right here. I'm not gonna bother with color change of 62 plus two, and so now we're trying to find out what the cube root of well 62 plus. I thought I had. It's gonna be 62. We now we want to find out what the cube root of 64 is. Well, the cube root of 64, I can go ahead and tell you, is 4. Because if you have 4 times 4, 4 times 4 is 16, and 4 times, and 16 times an additional 4, that third 4 is going to be 64. And you can go ahead and check that in your calculators if you like. But those are going to be our two answers. So our first answer is going to be negative 3. Our second answer is going to be 4. Ta-da! See? All right, guys, that concludes this today's session. Thank you so much. If you haven't done so yet, you can go write present in the chat box so I know you're today. You ha I have today's tenants for you. Um, thank you so much for everything. I hope this was helpful to you. I'll be posting the video as soon as it's finished uh, processing. And that's it for today. Thanks, guys. You guys can go ahead and you can zoom on out of here. <laughs>